The Jack and Daxter trilogy is one of, if not the best trilogies in gaming, but it's extremely underrated. To combat this, I thought it'd be best to go ahead and platinum the entire trilogy, just to showcase how great these games actually are. Now, if you watch my 10 platinums in 10 days video, you'll probably remember that I played Jack on for the challenge on my PS4. The PS3 collection is apparently the best way to play the Jack and Daxter trilogy, and even though it's kind of expensive, it was the only way I would be able to make a video on the entire trilogy without using pre-recorded footage from the PS4 version. So I caved in, and a few weeks later, got to work attempting these trophies. Of course, it goes without saying that this video will contain heavy spoilers, but if you're okay with that, grab some snacks and enjoy the journey. I told you we shouldn't have come here, and you listened! What? Okay, okay. I'm fine. I'm fine. Instead of heeding my wisdom, the two of you went mucking around in the only place that I told you not to go, Misty Island. That's right, and then And, Daxter, you finally took a much needed bath, but in a bathtub filled with dark eco. Look, old man, are you gonna keep yapping or are you gonna help me out of this mess? After we see Daxter get turned into an animal, we get briefed by a guy called Samus about an individual called Galacaron. This is more or less the whole aim of the first game, make it to Galacaron and turn Daxter back into a human. We start off by grabbing the first power cell of the game in the tutorial section, before opening the first door to unlock the trophy, Open Sesame. And then I collected the remaining precursor orbs to 100% this first area. Grabbing every precursor orb in the game ties to a trophy later down the line, so I had to make sure every area was 100% before moving on. Hey baby, what do you say you and I go cruising on this A-grab zoomer? Rule number one, I don't date animals. Ah, uh, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> My father always talked about an ancient precursor pipeline hidden deep underground. Some of these pipes end in vents from which eco flows freely, and some have been capped off so that the eco is sealed back. I traced part of the pipeline back to the Forbidden Temple. Maybe you should look there for some type of switch. Although Kira just explained we needed to find the Forbidden Jungle, I stupidly made my way towards Sentinel Beach instead, which I later found out to be the wrong choice. On the way to Sentinel Beach, we run into another collectible type called Scoutflies. These are hidden in red boxes all over the place, and all of them are required for a trophy later on in the game. Once finally making it to Sentinel Beach, there's a cannon that will continually shoot at you no matter what. This is pretty useful in the starting section because a few boxes are unable to be broken without the use of this cannon. After carefully destroying all the boxes, we can watch this pelican take our power cell. Hey! That pelican just snagged a power cell! Let's go kick some big bird butt! Before earning the trophy for collecting 100 orbs. There's 2,000 precursor orbs to collect throughout this entire game, so we were definitely in for a long ride. The next trophy I earned was called Eggs Over Hard and requires you to push this massive egg off a cliff in order to save an orphan bird from being captured. It thinks you're its mama. Ah, I'm not your mom. You see any feathers here? Oh, love at first sight. After collecting a few more power cells and a few more orbs, I set out to grab that power cell stolen by the pelican at the start of the level. This guy didn't go down without a fight, but after punching him to sleep, the power cell was spat out onto the cliff and I had to chase the pelican to the power cell in order to bag another trophy. Now that all these trophies were wrapped up, I cleared up the remaining orbs and cells within this area before reaching a section that had me stumped. I remembered from my previous playthrough of this game that this vent was meant to be open. However, as you can clearly see, this didn't seem to be the case this time around. I was pretty confused by this, but after a few minutes wandering around cluelessly, I remembered that Kira told us to hit the Forbidden Jungle first instead of Sentinel Beach. So of course, that's where I headed next, and on the way, I managed to find all the remaining scout flies and precursor orbs for Sandover Village. The first trophy to be earned in the Forbidden Forest is called Hand Over Fish. To earn this trophy, you need to catch 200 fish without accidentally catching any of the red ones. This is a pretty simple task that did take me a few attempts, but I eventually got the hang of it and got the trophy relatively easily. 
You did it! You caught 200 pounds of fish! Not bad for a couple of landlubbers. <laughs> the main task at hand right now was to open the vents blocking access to 100%ing Sentinel Beach. And to do this, I had to climb up the old precursor temple in the middle of the jungle. While making my way up, we can grab more orbs alongside the 28th scout fly. <laughs> And then we can ride this elevator down inside the precursor temple, do a bit of parkour on these floating platforms and reach another power cell. This time around, grabbing the power cell activated the pressured floor underneath us and opened all the blue eco vents on the island, which was way easier than I originally remembered. Now that the blue eco vents were open, it gave access to the first boss of the game called the dark eco plant. This was by no means a hard fight and was actually more fun than being difficult. To defeat this one, you have to clear all the enemies on the ground while avoiding the head slam attacks from the plant. Then then, once all the enemies are defeated, you have to climb the very generously placed leaves before hitting the head of the plant and landing on the floor. Repeat this two more times and the boss is defeated with no issues, earning us another trophy. Now, this might just be me, but what I really love about this game is just how simplistic it is. I love being able to just hop in the game and not have to religiously follow a guide or be wary of any missable trophies, and I think that's the beauty of the first entry into the series. The only thing left to do in the Forbidden Forest was to collect all the remaining precursor orbs before connecting every eco beam for another favor. With the Forbidden Forest complete, I returned back to Sentinel Beach to use the vents and clear up any remaining orbs and cells I may have missed. And upon grabbing the 25th power cell, I earned yet another trophy. Now that Sentinel Beach was complete, it was just Misty Island standing in the way of fully 100%ing the first area in the game. This area isn't too bad, but for some reason that I can't really explain, it was my least favorite area in this first section. As soon as we land on the island, there is a little yellow moose that needs to be caught for a guy back on the main island. This was kind of challenging as much as I hate to admit it. The whole chase mechanic in this game is pretty finicky and usually results in the moose turning around and heading the other way if you manage to get in front of it. I did eventually catch the moose, but to my surprise, it doesn't actually give you a trophy, which is funny since this is one of the harder challenges in the first area. So for now, we can head through this precursor door before getting jumped by a bunch of lurkers. It's an ambush, Jack! It's an ambush! This, as you may have guessed, pops another trophy once we eventually make it through the swarm of lurkers. The final trophy left on the island was for destroying all the balloon lurkers a bit later on in the area. This is a pretty unique segment because it's the first time we get to use the zoomer in the game and it's actually a really fun way to introduce it as well. This trophy requires you to take out all the balloon lurkers with the zoomer and it really gives you some much needed training for the section you'll see in a minute. After absolutely obliterating every lurker, a power cell spawns in out of nowhere and upon grabbing it, pops another trophy. And finally, once returning back to Sandover Village, we can hand the yellow moose back to the sculptor for the final power cell of the entire section. Great, you have the 20 cells needed to power my heat shield. Now be careful, the shield will only protect your zoomer till it reaches 500 degrees, so try to keep her cool. Flying over open lava will definitely heat you up fast. Hit 500 degrees and it's over. Over, like burning molten metal over? The fire canyon gets pretty hot, so keep a lookout for jumps to keep you off the hot ground. Unlike all the other areas so far, this one was necessary to complete for the progression of the story. There are only a few scout flies to collect here and two power cells, so it was just a case of hitting every scout fly box without dying, which was easier said than done. Use the hot turn to steer harder. But eventually, we can make it to the end, earning us the last scout fly and also the last power cell. I think by now, you can all kind of see the idea of this game. It's much like Spyro in the way that the collectibles and gameplay works. And to be honest, I was loving this playthrough even more than I originally thought I would. The Rock Village also houses one of my favorite areas in the game called the Precursor Basin. There are so many things to do in this section and so many trophies to be earned. Up first was a miscellaneous one for collecting 49 scout flies. 
And then I ran into the purple precursor ring challenge. This one really tests your skills on the Zumo because you need to hit every checkpoint in a set amount of time. And sometimes the purple ring will go in the complete opposite direction you assumed it would, costing time and possibly a restart. After managing to get through the challenge without failing, we can earn another trophy. The trophy catch as catch can was up next and was very similar to the struggle I had with the muse from earlier. Again, the main issue with this one was having to actually stay behind the lurker instead of trying to cut it off and get ahead. I'm not really sure why they designed these chase sequences the way that they have because it just longs out at the overall chase sequence as you gradually catch up to them. There were two lurkers to catch in this section and after catching both of them, a power cell drops alongside the trophy. Pretty close to this area was a group of dark eco infected plants that needed to be cured with green eco. This wasn't super hard, but it is time limited. So if you don't eliminate all the plants in time, they'll just respawn and you'll need to cure them again. Luckily, even with the time limit on the green eco, I still managed to get this one done relatively smoothly. And then we can attempt the last precursor ring challenge of the area. These blue rings were way harder than the purple ones and had constant twists and turns, making it impossible to achieve on your first attempt. But after getting pretty familiar with the path that the rings took, I soon earned the trophy. Now that the precursor basin was 100% complete, I headed over to what was probably my most hated section of the game, even more than Misty Island. The task at hand with the boggy swamp was to break all four tethers holding the zeppelin in place. These were scattered across the level and conveniently, once breaking the first one, I managed to grab the 50th power cell for a trophy. I stumbled across my 1000th precursor orb before attempting one of the most dreaded challenges of the game. I remember this one taking a few tries last time and I was genuinely not looking forward to it at all. To make matters worse, the camera for this particular section was inverted and wouldn't change no matter what setting I chose. I eventually got the hang of it though and after trying my hardest to keep Farthy's snacks from being eaten, this happened. Well, fry my hide! You sure know how to shoot! Thanks a heap for the help! With every miscellaneous trophy now out of the way, I broke the last tether on the Zeppelin and made my way back to Kira with all my hard earned power cells. Great, you have the cells for the machine. They ought to provide enough power to lift that boulder. There we go. Now be careful facing that monster lurker at the top. Wait, uh, I'll stay here and protect Kira. Jack? I think you're ready to handle that monster without me. Oh, really heroic of you. Claw was the next boss to be defeated, and I just have to say, the boss music in this fight is probably one of my favorite tracks in the entire game. I handled this fight pretty smoothly. It was the classic three hits and a down kind of fight. So it's just a case of dodging all the attacks, picking up the blue eco and constructing the platform before picking up the yellow eco and shooting him to drop the massive ball on his head. Do this two more times and the trophy fell right into my hands. Up next was another Zuma challenge, but this time it wasn't over lava and honestly, really wasn't much of a challenge at all. The only thing to look out for was of course, the power cells and the scout flies, but I luckily tracked them down with relative ease. What have you two done with the blue and red sages? Don't worry about your colorful friends, you old fool. They're perfectly safe in our citadel, our special guests. They have graciously agreed to help us on a little Project. You were wrong, Samos. Dark Eco can be controlled. We've learned its secrets, and now we can reshape the world to our liking. <laughs> Wait a minute! That was Gull? The same Gull who's supposed to change me back? Gull is the guy trying to kill us? I'm doomed. Now we were closing in on the final section of the game. And to get there, we just had to grab a few more trophies. The first of which being in a dreaded spider cave. If you watched me play this game before, you'll understand the struggle I went through with this section and just how much it stopped me in my tracks. However, literally like everything else that I thought would be a challenge, 
this actually didn't turn out to be too bad. I don't really know why this was the case. Maybe I've just become a better player overall, or maybe the PS3 version of the game is much easier. I'm not too sure. And to be honest, I wasn't really complaining as this was definitely the best experience I've had on this game so far. In the spider cave, there were five dark eco crystals spread across the entire area. And some of them were pretty hard to find. But after grabbing four of these crystals, the last one was shot down with some yellow eco and the trophy was mine. The snowy mountains were up next and I really wasn't super keen on this area. It became pretty clear to me that personally in each area there was at least one section that didn't really hit the same as the rest but I still made my way through grabbing every orb I could find and eventually stumbled across a section required for a trophy. I actually wasn't aiming for any trophies at this point and was more or less just exploring the area looking for power cells and scout flights. There's some red eco at the entrance to the cave and this red eco makes you more powerful than usual which is handy because this cave is filled to the brim with lurkers. There's only one more trophy to collect in the snowy mountains and it requires you to take out three of these glacier troops and the catch is you can only eliminate them while harnessing red eco as it makes you strong enough to take them down. <laughs> All right, with these additional power cells, I should be able to supply the heat shield with enough power to stand up to this lava. But the shield still has a limit. It will now withstand temperatures up to 800 degrees, but no more. So keep an eye on your gauge. I don't want to think about what those temperatures would do to your zoomer if the shield gives out. Yeah, the heat. What? The zoomer? Hey, what about us? Don't you think we could look for a safer route to Girl Citadel? This lava tube is the last one in the game and is better than the first one in every way. It's longer, there's more collectibles, it's harder than the first one, and it makes you actually use the balloons to get more time on the lava, which is something I felt the first lava tube kind of lacked as it was so short. There's also a section about halfway through that requires you to shoot these balls of fire while also making sure you're still collecting the blue balloons in order to not overheat. Overcoming all of these challenges and obstacles chucked in your way throughout this final section really felt worth it when the trophy finally pops at the end. short, green, and wrinkly. This is terrible. Father is missing. I think Gall and Maya may have kidnapped him as well. Relax, sweetheart. I got everything under control. You've got to rescue my father before it's too late. And Jack, be careful. Yeah, we will be. To rescue all the sages, we need to go through a bunch of different challenges in order to free each one. To rescue the red sage, we need to eliminate a whole horde of enemies using only the red eco, which is actually way harder than it seems, but I eventually got past it. To rescue the blue sage, we have to maneuver our way through this area that is pretty challenging due to how many jumps require accurate jumps or else you fall to your death. I did die multiple times here, but I eventually made it to the Blue Sage. The Yellow Sage was up next and was probably my favorite challenge just due to not having something like this in the entire game so far. It was fun to jump from platform to platform and you have to time your jumps in a way to be able to collect more Blue Eco so that no momentum is lost. After a few tries, the Yellow Sage was now a free man. Samus was the final sage as he was actually the green sage in the game, but as he was the last sage, it also meant that leading up to his freedom, I had to take a detour to collect the last scout fly of the game. As well as the last precursor orb of the game. And then finally, the last power cell of the game that unlocks while also freeing Samus. Good work, boys. You're real heroes now. I'll combine my green eco power with the other three sages, and together we'll open the shield door surrounding the precursor robot. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like a good start. And then after you guys open that shield, what are you gonna do about the robot? Nothing, Daxter. We have to keep the shield open. It's up to you two to figure out how to destroy the robot. 
Oh, right. I get to help the guy that turned me into a furball destroy the only person who can turn me back! The only trophy left in the game at this point was to defeat Gollum Maya in the Precursor Robot. This fight has heavy use of the Yellow Eco to shoot certain parts of the robot, and as I mentioned earlier, this whole shooting thing was stuck in inverted mode and it made for a pretty difficult experience. To be honest though, I think that was the only thing that I struggled with on this fight, and after playing around with the inverted mode for a bit, I did start to rewire my brain to understand what to do. The final phase of this fight didn't actually require me to aim in, and instead, I just hip fired my way through fairly easily. Why, Nico? That could be the stuff to chase me back! Or, you might stop that robot. Hmm. Stay fuzzy, save the world. Choices. Okay, fine. We'll save the world. But do it quickly before I change my mind! With Daxter giving up his shot to return back to normal, all the sages combined their power to form White Eco, and before I knew it, this amazing game was over. Do something! It appears to be reading out some preset coordinates. Wow, look at that. Finally, the last rift gate has been opened. Yeah! What are those things? So this is how it happened. Do something, Jack! What's this do? Or, or that? How about this one? Everybody press all the buttons! What was that thing? Hang on, everyone! Find yourself, Jack! After entering the Precursor Ring, Jack and Daxter get teleported to Haven City. Jack is taken to the Baron and is immediately injected with Dark Eco. Fast forward two years and Daxter is here to save the day. I've been looking for you for two years! Say something! Just this once! I'm gonna kill Praxis! Shh! Right now we gotta get you out of here. Just let me figure out how to open the security locks for your chair so I can- Alright, you can do it. Easy now. Easy, buddy. It's it's your old pal Daxter, remember? Daxter? What the heck was that? Sheesh! Remind me not to piss you off. With the dark eco power now inside of Jack, we can figure out a way to escape this prison and in doing so, find our first precursor orb. Due to being teleported so far into the future, these orbs are now in limited quantities and are worth way more than before. There are 286 precursor orbs to grab, so I made sure to grab every single one that I came across in order to make my life a little bit easier post game. After escaping the prison, we get introduced to someone called Cor, who we will learn way more about later in the story. This then prompts the first combat section of the game and the game forces you to turn into Dark Jack. This is a new feature within Jack 2 and to be honest, I didn't use it nearly as much as I probably should have. Either way, after defeating these guards, we can get our first trophy. Thank you for your help, but I must get this boy to safety. Hey! What about us? There is an underground group waging war against Baron Praxis. Its leader, the Shadow, could use fighters like you. 
And then we get introduced to the main transportation feature of this game. Just like many others that have played this game before, I wasn't super fond of the direction that they took from the spiral like gameplay of Jack 1 to the more mature GTA style gameplay of Jack 2. It felt like it was more about following the trends of gaming at that current moment in time, rather than sticking with the foundation that was laid out in Jack 1 and making improvements. This game also suffers from, in my opinion, pretty boring missions. The majority of the missions feel more like side missions in that they're basically just glorified chores that you have to go back and forth doing random stuff that, in my opinion, didn't really need to be there. Jack 3 does an amazing job at taking these chore-like missions, turning them into ones that actually felt justified, as you'll see a little bit later. But for now, we can head to the underground for the first few missions of the game. Steal the Baron's banner from the top of the ruined tower and bring it back to me. Then, maybe we'll talk. I had no trouble getting this banner for Torn, and I knocked the trophy in doing so. In the next mission, we get introduced to the Metalheads. These are a type of enemy within the game and drop Metalhead Skull Gems that act as a collectible within this game. The goal is to collect 510 gems, which does sound a lot, but is passively earned over the course of the game pretty easily. These barrels are the latest shipment of eco. The Baron says take them and get out. Metalheads in the city? Why are the guards giving them eco? This basically means that Baron is backdooring the enemy's dark eco, and we have to find out why. Before that though, we have to blow up this ammo supply and earn ourselves another trophy. We then get sent on a delivery mission to deliver some eco ore to crew. This mission was actually kind of difficult as there's so many crimson guards in your way and with the checkpoint system being so unfair in this game, it was just a little taste of the difficulty to come. Once arriving at the location, we meet crew and after asking about the dark eco shipments to the metalheads, crew gives us our first weapon and explains that if we can show our worth at the gun range, we will get the information we need. The gun range is probably one of the greatest additions in the game in my opinion. With most weapons you unlock in this game, there is usually a gun range mission ready to be played so that you can get to grips with the weapon that you've unlocked. Instead of actually giving us any info on the dark eco shipments, crew invites us to become a wastelander and work for him grabbing items outside the city walls. Jack and Dactor accept, and the first mission as a wastelander is to protect Sig from the metalheads while he tries his best to eliminate five of the larger ones for crew. This is the first mission that, in my opinion, really upped the difficulty spike. The first checkpoint is right at the very start of the level, and that's the only checkpoint. This meant that I basically had to kill all the metalheads while protecting Sig from harm and also making sure I didn't die in the process all in one life. Eventually though, Sig managed to eliminate all the big metalheads, and as a reward, we got another trophy. Upon returning back to crew, he finally explains why Baron is dealing with the metalheads. We're not doing anything until you tell us why metalheads are trading with the Baron's forces. Oh, I should have had some both kneecaps, eh? All I know is that the Baron cut a desperate deal with the metalhead leader. Metalheads need eco, so the Baron supplies them with regular shipments. In return, the Metalheads agree to attack the city just enough to satisfy the Baron's continued rule. And then we get invited to race against Errol at the stadium, and crew thought it seemed fit to go ahead and sign the race contract without our permission. I've uh, already signed your name to save time. Hmm? We the racers hereby agree to give crew all proceeds from race earnings, endorsement fees, broadcast royalties, syndication residuals, vehicle sponsorships, small appearance fees, collectible card assets, fast food tie-ins, use of likeness rights, talk show deals, clothing lines, all print rights including book, novella, comic, pamphlet, ticket tape, neon sign, and bathroom graffiti designs. <sighs> Toy rights, shoe lines, mood rings, game rights. Game rights? Vitamin endorsements, city kickback movie deals, and of course, all death and dismemberment accident insurance claims. <laughs> we can work out the tiny details later. To get a chance at the race, we need to reach the stadium in under three minutes. This would have been probably the most simple task of the whole game, had it not have been for the Crimson Guards to get in your way, starting a worldwide chase while you attempt to reach the stadium on time. After reaching the stadium though, we are introduced to a familiar sounding voice that explains what we need to do in order to race. Uh, hello? Crew said someone was looking for a race driver? I'm busy right now. You must be Crew's new errand boy. Is there anything we can do? No! 
I'm uh, working on a secret uh, uh, vehicle project. Okay, sorry. Listen, if you think you've got the guts to race in this town, try taking my prototype jet board out on the stadium court. Beat the stadium challenge and maybe I'll consider you for my team. The Jetboard missions are pretty fun to be honest. It reminds me of the old Tony Hawk games as you need to do certain tricks, grinds and jumps to accumulate a set amount of points. After barely beating the score, we can head back to Torn before getting informed about an individual called Vin, Vinny saving from the strip mine. While attempting to save Vin, we can pop the trophy for collecting 50 metalhead skull gems. After plowing through a few more metalheads, we can save Vin and bring him back to Haven City for another trophy. One of my old guard comrades was sent to the pumping station. There's been no word from the patrol. And after what you guys ran into out there, I'm afraid she may need some help. Did you say she? Don't even think about it. Stop that! This is serious, you moron. Ha! That's right. Don't mess with the sugar. I really love how they made Daxter's character just that little bit more funnier as it really brings a charm to this game that the first one definitely didn't have. Torn then sends us on another mission to find someone named Ashlyn and of course we get ambushed by a bunch of metalheads. I wasn't really complaining as this allowed us to grab way more metalhead gems than usual and brought us closer to that 510 gem trophy. Watching me take care of those metalheads was uh, pretty exciting, wasn't it sugar? Hey! Sweet strikes! Give me them digits so I can look you up sometime! We'll party hard! Big city style! Tell Torn Baron Praxis is planning something big. I think it has to do with that symbol. What is it? It's the seal of the House of Mar, the founder of Haven City. We're being sent out on suicide missions to locate artifacts from the time of his rule. After saving Ashlyn, we run into Onim for the first time, and what I really love about this character is that she requires a bird called Pecker to be her translator. And this makes for some pretty funny interactions between Pecker and Daxter. She says it is good to see you again, Jack, but we've never met before. Before, after, it is all the same. Ow, ow, let me try. Ah, uh, she wants a, she wants a yakow bone, a yakow bladder. No, no, I got it. For many moons, she has waited for a juice pop? A jewel shop? Oh, oh, I know! She's got a hairball! A hair lip! A hairy chest! Onin sends us on a mission to find three artifacts, and then we speak to Vin and are tasked with destroying a bunch of eggs at the drill platform. This was in no means hard, but yet again, the controls were inverted, and there was no option to turn them back to normal. It's a little more ego for the city. <laughs> now that we had completed a favor for Vin, it was time for him to complete a favor for us. If he could power up the elevators near Baron's palace, we could theoretically get there and see what he's up to. Vin also mentions about an individual called Ma, who basically built the entire city, and we will learn more about him as the game goes on. To power up the elevator, we need to power on five switches, covered by turrets. These weren't too hard, and after destroying all five turrets, we can earn ourselves another trophy. Now that the elevator was working, we could take it to the top and see exactly what Baron was planning to do with all that eco. I've told you I will have more eco by week's end. We'll transport it directly to your nest as promised. A deal is of no value if you can't deliver, my dear Baron. I grow impatient with your puny gestures. Give me the agreed upon eco soon or the deal is off and your precious city will pay the price. As you wish, with enough persuasion, I'm sure our spy. What was that? Because Daxter just had to sneeze and reveal our location, the Baron comes to the roof and this starts the first boss battle of the game. I actually struggled with this one quite a bit and at one point I even jumped off the building by accident which was definitely not the best thing to do. To defeat Baron, you have to shoot him enough times to take his shield all the way down and then hit him a few times before he charges back up. Do this about 2-3 times and he will move on to the next area and you basically just have to repeat that same sequence again but this time avoiding all the bombs being chucked at you. The final stage of this fight is completely different to the other ones as Baron starts shooting spinning fire at you while also doing a charge attack that deals a pretty significant amount of damage. Of course Baron didn't stand a chance and eventually the fight was over. The dark powers I gave you can't protect you forever! Since I made you, I can destroy you! We'll meet again soon! 
A little while after this, we can grab the 250th metal head gem before running into an old friend at the underground hideout. So, you're the new recruits who keep getting into trouble. Oh no, not you! Welcome to our humble underground movement. I am known as the Shadow, but you may call me Samos. And you are? Jeez, Jack, we went through all that to meet His Holiness, old log in the head, Grandpa Green? Don't you know who we are? Sorry, kid, never seen you before. And I never forget a face, especially one that ugly. So it begins. Then we can catch five scouts for Samus. Excellent work, boys. Protect Ashlyn yet again from more metalheads and head down to the sewers to drain out the water for a future mission involving the statue of Ma. Hey, be careful with that. Plasmite, huh? Cool. How does it work? Ah! I believe this is yours. Hey, not my problem anymore. <laughs> no, really, I insist. Uh, uh, you're the hero! No! Jack's the hero! Oops. Sorry. My bad. Hey, go through the portal and drop one bomb into each eco well before they all go off! You only have two minutes! The jet board has got to be one of the best features in the game, and to have it required for a few missions throughout really changes things up a little bit. And after chucking the bombs in all six strip mines before the time ran out, we can head back to Vin to earn a well-deserved trophy. Thank goodness you blew up those wells. I sure don't want any more metalheads coming around here. Good work, boys. I owe you one. Eventually, we can head to the mechanic and finally find out who is behind the curtain. Let me handle this, Jack. Listen, lady, we beat your stupid course, and we can outrace anybody in this city. Wait, that voice. Now, there's just two things you need to know. One, we don't want to join your stinking race team. And two, you just lost a date with Orange Lightning. Let's go, Jack. Daxter, it is you! Kira! Oh, I never thought I'd be so glad to see your furry mug. Kira states that the easiest way to meet Baron face to face is to win the racing championship. But to do that, we have to win all three classes, starting with class three. This was, as expected, a pretty simple race, but it wouldn't get super difficult until we reach class one a bit later in the story. When is this city gonna provide some challenge, huh? Hey, I watched your race today. You were pretty amazing out there. Oh, thanks. Uh, Kira, uh, this is Ashlyn. She's just- Everyone knows who she is. And Kira's a... a friend. A very good friend. We are then required to find all the Seal of Mar pieces, with the first one being at the water slums, and then kill all the guards before heading to the dig site to collect the second seal piece. Wait a minute. I think this time you should go get the thing. Looks dodgy up there. Don't hurt yourself, Jack. <laughs> It's a curse, isn't it? The third and final piece of the seal can be given to us by Onan, but only when we beat this dance dance revolution type of mini game, where we need to collect 700 points. This was honestly way harder than it looks, just because of how fast the button prompts are coming in on the screen, especially when a group of them burst onto the screen and you're required to hit all of them at once. Eventually, I did manage to pass this task and grab the third and final seal as part of the reward. You must take the three artifacts to Mars Gate. Only then would the light tower rise and reveal the tomb. After arriving at the forest, we can place a few artifacts in the desired locations to find out exactly where Mars' tomb is located. To access a tomb, the heir to Ma must take the tomb challenges on alone, the heir to Ma being the little kid. However, the voice in the tomb states otherwise. This child is too young to face the tests. What? No! Do something, Jack! And Jack makes a split decision to take on the tomb challenges himself. There were two challenges in this tomb, and both were pretty challenging. The left side of the tomb had you running from a massive spider that reminded me of the spider section in Gollum. And the right side of the tomb had you gliding over electrified water, jumping over puzzling platforms, and figuring out which beetle is the correct one to hit in order to progress forward. Both sides of this tomb had their own challenges. And after beating all of them, we can finally enter the main part of the tomb. Welcome, young warrior. Many eons have passed since our hope burned so brightly. Today, you have proven yourself worthy to receive Ma's legacy. 
He's talking about me! Thanks, you holy statuness. This tomb wasn't so tough. Just as we are about to grab the precursor stone, Baron, of course, shows up in his flying machine and we have to beat him yet again. He has a few new weapons this time, but I actually found this fight way easier than the last time we encountered him. To defeat Baron this time, you have to hit these bombs directly at the machine and then defeat all the little electric spiders that he summons. It does get to a point where he starts shooting at you, but you can very easily avoid this if you hit him with a bomb before he gets to you. Nice try, but the stone is still mine. Don't worry, I will use the stone to its full potential. Soon all who oppose me will be destroyed by its power. How did the Baron know we were so close to making a move for the stone? It's my fault. The Baron threatened to kill Ashland for spying. His own daughter. I couldn't risk that, even for the Underground. Right. Very good thinking. Except Praxis has the Precursor Stone now, so he can do whatever he wants! This cutscene didn't really explain it too well, but essentially, Baron kidnapped all of our friends, and it is of course our job to get them back. We make our way through countless Crimson Guards and Robot Spiders just to free everyone from their cells. This is also where we finally get reunited with our Samus from the first game. Hey there, sweetheart! The Metalhead Masher has saved the day! Oh, and I let Jack tag along too. Oh, my little hero. Samus, are you all right? What took you so long? I added six rings to my trunk waiting for you two to get me out of here. Great Yakow horns. What happened to you, Jack? Wait a minute. You're you. I mean, the other you. I mean, you know what I mean. A little bit later on, crew forces us to escort a few soldiers down to the sewers to the statue of Ma, eventually finding the heart of Ma. This heart of Ma is the main thing that powers the Rift Rider from the start of the game. You know, the thing that got us into this mess in the first place and was now in the hands of crew. Upon returning back to Kira, we are greeted with Errol instead. He throws a few threats and lets us know he's a racing champion. And surprisingly, Kira agrees with this as well. And then Jack gets annoyed and walks off in a strop, leaving Daxter to race on his own. Jack? Jack? Attention all drivers. The class two races will begin soon. Now what are we gonna do? You'll have to drive for the team, Daxter. We need this win to qualify for the final championship. How hard can it be? Just uh, hold on tight and point the thingy where I want it to go, right? And then there's the other thingy that makes it go fast. Fast is good. I can do this. I'm ready to race. This race was pretty similar to the first one and had a few corners that you could jump over with a boost to get ahead of the race. I quite like the switch out in this game, forcing you to play as Daxter for once. And to be honest, I was hoping this would become a regular feature moving forward. Now there's a handsome winner. You did it, Daxter. You helped us qualify for the big race. Did you ever doubt? I backseat drive for Jack all the time. Hey, when do I get the winner's big kiss? Maybe later, if you're a good boy. And then, before attempting the first class race, Crew had something that he wanted to say to us. Jack, I want you to throw the championship race. <gasps> Just let Errol win. You bet against us? Jack, Jack, it's just business. You've become a symbol to those townies. They'll bet everything on a glimmer of hope. What better time to make money? What do you say, my boy? I'd say you're gonna lose a lot of money. Errol then brings up the proposition for a 1v1 race around the city, and if Errol wins, he wins Kira. Jack would of course not let that happen, and after a few attempts due to the awkward controls within this game, we smoked Errol, and he flies off, crying to himself. Ah, uh, blow it out your ear! You were bottle fed, weren't you? We can then grab the life seed from Samus' hut and take it to Onan, where she can power it up for younger Samus. Once younger Samus gets a hold of the seed, he has a vision where Baron will destroy the Precursor Stone, wiping everything out with it and that he must be stopped. With this newly found information, we can head out in search of any way to stop Baron before meeting up with Kira for another race. I've been building a replica of our crashed Rift Ride machine from old artifacts. That's my girl! But I'm still missing two pieces. Figures. Vin says I need an artifact called the Time Map, and an old energy gem history books call the Heart of Mar. I've seen the Heart of Mar. Crew has it. We'll get those two artifacts, Kira. Attention all drivers. The Class 1 Championship race is about to begin. Well, here goes. The race of my life. This Class 1 race was more or less just another 1v1 race against Errol. This game has a rubber banding situation where no matter how fast you go, Errol will catch up. So essentially, you have to be in first place the entire race 
and I can pretty much guarantee this is impossible on your first try, is you need to nail down every single maneuver and corner skip to perfectly stay ahead of Errol. Now, I will be honest, the only reason I beat this race when I did is because Errol decided to drive off the racetrack and end himself before even finishing the race. I don't think this is what is meant to happen, but it allowed me to finish the race with no issues now that the 1v1 situation was no longer a thing. Surprise. What? Just a little closer. We need to talk. Fool! Don't you get it? It's over, Jack! All the heroes died long ago. Only survival remains. By whatever means, this city is mine. These lives are mine. This war is mine. War people die. Kill them. With the race out of the way, we are granted access to the Baron's place and are greeted by Ashlyn. She lets us know that Baron is meeting with crew at the weapons lab and gives us a keycard to get there. After reaching the weapons lab and dealing with a bunch of Crimson Guards, the Baron is of course nowhere to be seen, but after riding this elevator to the top, we find crew making a weapon to crack open the Precursor Stone. As soon as the Baron shows up with a stone, we'll hide it in the last shipment of Eco and deliver it to the Metalhead Nest. A surprise dessert, eh? <laughs> Just take this gun upgrade and forget what you saw here. Not this time, crew. I'm through being your hired gun. Then it's war, isn't it? I actually really enjoyed this fight and it was pretty easy all things considered. You just have to eliminate all the mini ghost crews that he sends out before spamming him with your weapon that stun locks him into not being able to attack. After doing this two more times, crew gives up and drops the heart of Ma for us to take. <laughs> Is it too late to give my notice? Yeah, we quit. The city is already dead. I've sold you all out. <laughs> uh, Jack, I think maybe we should be anywhere else. Just about now. We then fly off with Ashlyn and crew gets blown up into pieces, unlocking us two more trophies. Father, I'll take the heart of Marta Kira for you. I'm sorry it's come to this. Up next was a version of Whack-A-Mole that has you hitting different metal heads with a D-pad and button layout. This was pretty fun and only took me a couple tries, allowing us to receive the time map and more importantly, the last item needed for the Rift Rider. Tess also lets us know that Sig is trapped deep underground and being swarmed by metal heads. And after traversing the waters in the suit to get to him, we have to escape this massive metal head, which unfortunately results in Sig falling to his doom. You and me, side by side, nothing will stop us, cause we're- Shit! So, uh, what's plan B? With the loss of our closest ally, we help both Seamuses carry the Rift Rider to be lifted away towards the Metalhead Nest. Must be nice floating away while we die down here! And then, a few moments later, Vin lets us know that the Baron is at the construction site. Once approaching the site, we get to see who Kor really is. Kor, what's going on? I'm sure you know. Deep down in your darkest nightmares. We've met before, remember? Everything's going exactly as planned. <laughs> Jack! It's the Metalhead leader! No, you see. Without the shield wall disrupting my powers inside the city, I am my full potential now. So for the last time, give me the precursor stone! If the city must die, then we all die! Ah! With Baron now dead, Daxter grabs the precursor stone and we head out to the Metalhead Nest to finish this once and for all. There's a bunch of Metalheads in this area, which of course makes sense, and after defeating them all, we can place the precursor stone into this machine to blow a massive hole into the nest. A bunch more Metalhead corpses later, and we can finally run into Core again. Finally, you've decided to join us, and you brought the precursor stone. Good. The boy will now play his final part. Not this time. Oh, but this child is such a part of this. Such a part of you. Don't you recognize him? The boy is you, Jack. 
And this place, this is where you began in the future. But how? You were hidden in the past on the hope that you would gain the skills to face me today. But Onan was wrong. Now that you've been altered with Dark Eco, the stone will never open for you. Your younger self, however, still has the pure gift. He alone can awaken the stone and the precursor entity which sleeps inside. This then starts the final boss fight of the game, and while trying to defeat Kor, I unlock the trophy for collecting 510 Metalhead Gems. The final boss fight in this game was a lot like the second fight we had with Baron. There were so many smaller enemies to deal with that it was hard to actually deal any damage towards Kor at all. But after getting his health down to the last bar, he drops onto the floor and chases you around, all while still spawning in enemies and also running faster than your own run speed, which I thought was pretty unfair. As you can probably guess by now, this guy did not stand a chance. And finally, after all this time, the story was complete. I'm afraid your Rift Rider must be used to send young Jack here to a place where he will grow up safe from harm. He must become old enough to complete the destiny he has fulfilled today. Wait a minute. It's you. I, I mean, it's me. I have to take him back and watch over him, don't I? Ah, grub roots. Talk about being in the wrong time at the right place. I'll take good care of the child. And don't worry. I'll be back in time for the celebration. Farewell! Welcome to the Naughty Atso, the hippest, happiest, happiest joint in town. Check out the new decor. Ooh, what a big trophy. As if size matters. I bagged that bad boy myself, baby. Onan says she doesn't know who has a bigger head, him or you. We must not forget Vin and all the others who sacrificed their lives to defeat this evil and protect the child. I still can't believe that little boy was me. Better times, huh? Now that the game was finally over, the only thing standing in the way of the Platinum was to collect 286 Precursor Orbs. These Precursor Orbs can be obtained by collecting them throughout the story, but the vast majority of these orbs came from the side missions within the game. There were a few races that needed to be beaten in a set time, a jetboard mission that required a set amount of points, a bomb collecting mission, a bunch of orb hunting missions, beating scores at the gun range, and the list goes on and on, with 38 unique side missions to complete. These side missions would give anywhere from 3 to 8 or 9 orbs per mission, and while completing these side missions, the trophy collectivist popped for collecting 125 orbs. And then, once I wrapped up the side missions, I went ahead and collected the last few remaining precursor orbs that I had missed, earning me that well-deserved platinum trophy. People, you are hereby banished to the wasteland for life. This is a death sentence, Vigor. There must be another way. Your protest was overruled. This dark eco freak is dangerous. Now drop the cargo! This is an outrage! I am outraged beyond words! Although I do have something to say. Not everyone agrees with this ridiculous decree! Yeah! We want a recount! Oh, I see you wish to join him. Actually, we are not that outraged. Farewell, Jack! May the precursors have mercy on you. Daxter! Don't thank me! I'm only here because you wouldn't last a second without me. Okay, tough guy, you got us into this mess. Now you gotta get us out. As you just saw, Jack 3 starts off with Jack, Daxter and Pekka being banished from Haven City and left in the wasteland to supposedly die. After walking around for a little bit, they all pass out from the heat and this is when we get a glimpse into what happened between Jack 2 and 3. Essentially, even though we eliminated Core, the strongest metalheads still survived and started an all-out attack on Haven City. The Council of Haven City were quick to blame Jack for the situation due to his connections with crew and that is basically the reason he was kicked out of Haven City into the wasteland. 
Eventually, we are found by an individual called Damus and we are taken back to Spargus City where it's explained that this city is full of people that are no longer wanted at Haven City. We are welcomed with open arms as long as we are able to prove our worth at the arena. I think it's important to note that Pekka got out of this situation by becoming Damus's pet, basically taking the role he previously had with Onan. The challenges within this area serve more as a tutorial rather than actually being difficult. So this first section wasn't necessarily too bad and after defeating a few enemies, we could earn the first of three amulets. After this, we have a run-in with Cleaver who asserts his dominance before forcing us to take down six Kanga rats that keep raiding his storerooms. This is the first time we get to ride leapers and they're the main transportation feature in Spargo City. By getting close to the Kanga rats, you can press square to eat them and after eating all six, our first trophy popped. I'll let you take one of me rides for a spin. Get in, Dax. I'll drive. Can't wager a little something on a race, then. If you win, I'll let you keep that little vehicle for as long as you live. And if I win, I don't have anything. I'd say that yappy rodent of yours is a bit bony, but skinned and butted, he'd make a nice treat. My vehicle against him. Forget it, buddy. Jack would never- Done. What? Don't worry. If there's one thing I can do, it's race. This race was a great way to introduce the new vehicles in the game, and I know this is a weird reference, but if you've ever played GTA 4, then the cars handle exactly like that. I'll be honest, Cleaver didn't stand a chance, and I quickly won the race to earn another trophy. After this though, we are tasked with collecting artifacts in the wasteland and was chucked straight into the open world aspect of this game. The wasteland is a massive open space that you can freely drive around in, which I was genuinely not expecting, but slowly became one of my favorite additions to the game. The only annoying thing about the wasteland is having to avoid and shoot down these vehicles that continuously spawn in, but that didn't stop me from collecting all the artifacts in a specified time. This isn't a game. I am Seam. We monks are sworn to discover and protect the secrets of the Precursors. Why are you so obsessed with them? Because of that, the Daystar approaches, and every day it grows brighter. This planet's final trial is coming. It might not seem significant now, but that purple orb in the sky is a pretty big deal later down the line. Moving on, we eventually get told to challenge the arena again, and this is when we receive a weapon upgrade for the shotgun. As you will see later on, this game starts to have an amazing selection of weapons, and actually makes the combat 10 times more enjoyable than it was in Jack 2. After eliminating more enemies, we passed the arena and received another weapon upgrade alongside the second amulet of the game. The next mission given by Damus was to herd a few leapers into the electrified pen, and what I really like about this mission is that we get to play as Daxter once again. This took a few tries to get the hang of, but after understanding that you cannot hit anything and it's impossible to slow down, I eventually managed to get three leapers into the pen. Oh yeah! That's right! I have to admit, you got some talent, kid. Have another one of me vehicles. You earned it. We then get access to one of my favorite vehicles in the game. It's pretty unique in comparison to the other vehicles due to how high it can jump. And it's also the only vehicle able to get us to the temple as the path there is pretty impossible otherwise. Upon reaching the temple, the path is blocked by this purple floating thing. And to get around it, we have to climb to the top. Once at the top, we get to do something that I never thought would be possible in a Jack game. Ooh, sweet. Seems said they lost an expedition of monks on the volcano. I bet they built these gliders to reach the top. Yeah, lost being the operative word. If they vanished, don't you think that was a sign? Hello? Yeah, but you've got me. All we have to do is hit those accelerator rings and we're golden. Oh no! See any feathers here? Looks like fur to me. No feathers, no fly of the axle. There's no way you're gonna get me on some precursor monk crap! Absolutely zippo chance! Forget it, finito! Fat chance, not gonna happen! Nope, nah, never. Jack! I can safely say now they went above and beyond for this game. Naughty Dog took Jack 2 and ironed out all the bad things I can think of before hitting us with Jack 3. Not to say this game doesn't have any flaws, but I do think it's the best entry into the series since the first one. Once wrapping up the glider section, we have to make our way through a few metalheads before getting to play as Daxter once again. While doing this section, we can grab the 25th metalhead gem for another trophy. This time, instead of 510 gems like in Jack 2, we only have to collect 250, which again, pretty much came passively while playing the game. After making my way through the volcano a little bit further, we stumble across a corpse holding a dark eco object. Look out! 
out, Daxter! Jack? Jack? Where are you, buddy? Hey! It's a dark power, Dax. Some kind of invisibility. Yeah, well, cut it out! If you moved that fast a long time ago, I'd still be wearing pants. You know what I really miss? Soft underpants. You know how it lifts and cradles? <sighs> you wouldn't understand. With the ability to now turn invisible, we can make it past this purple object no problem and eventually get greeted by a precursor statue who cleanses some of our dark eco in return for some light eco. This allows us to fill up our light eco bar, which really wasn't super useful until a bit later on. After gaining the light eco ability, we can save a few people in the wasteland, beat Cleaver's high score on this defense weapon, and then finally, get in the arena one last time to prove our worth as a Spargo citizen. This was going pretty well until we met a familiar face, making it impossible to win the arena for the third time. Sig? Jack? Dexter? Sig! Well, don't you two look sorrier than ever. What are you doing here? Honing my skills. Let's finish this. Whoa, come on, Sig. I'm not gonna fight you. If we don't, he'll kill us both. Rule of the arena. Sorry, nothing personal. Uh-oh. Blasphemy! One must destroy the other. Complete the test, or face worse pain. Damus let us off pretty lightly, all things considered, and forces us to clear out a group of metalheads with Sig. We end up using Sig's car, which has a turret on the top and has pretty powerful acceleration, allowing us to eliminate all the eggs with relative ease. <laughs> We can then meet up with Ashlyn, who explains that Haven City needs our help. Jack initially refuses before getting jumped by hunters in the wasteland. After dealing with all of them, Jack receives the Seal of Ma, which is used to unlock hidden places around Haven City, and presumably Sparga City too. We return back to the Precursor statue once again, this time receiving the ability to freeze time using the Light Eco. This was actually a really cool ability, but I'll be completely honest, not a single section after this point required this ability, and I kind of forgot about it as the game went on. Either way, we can progress through the temple before stumbling across a door that is only opened due to the fact we have the seal. There you are. Ah, I'm so squawking happy I found you. Look, Jack got his seal back, and it opens doors. Onan says we must get back to Haven City. She says the catacombs are the key to the planet's very survival. You boys up for a little ride? Now that we had a one-way ride to Haven City, we just had to dodge all the obstacles in the way, which surprisingly took more tries than I would have imagined. Eventually though, I bested the catacombs and made it through to the other side, where we were greeted by a precursor, unlocking another ability. You show promise, but your bravery will not protect you from the foes you must soon face. Use this light power to help in your quest. It is what little we have left to offer. The next few sections were pretty easy. We get a trophy for just making our way through the eco mine. And then we had to escort a bomb train, shooting each section so the train can carry on moving down the rails. Any mission with the jet board, I instantly enjoy. So this was a fun trophy to earn. After blowing up the entrance, we can meet Count Vigo, the guy that banished us from Haven City in the first place. And he explains that he destroyed the palace in the city in order to reap the secrets from underneath. So far, letting the metalheads destroy the palace. Oh, no, you couldn't be more mistaken, dear boy. We're on a time clock, Jack. That light in the sky, do you know what it is? Our nightmare has found us and the end is coming. I needed quick access to the catacombs below, so I attacked the palace myself. Uh, excuse me, Count Volga. It's Vega! Yeah, whatever. Isn't it kind of nice just to curl up in the shade sometimes? Just chilling it, watching the hot babes prance around in their skimpy little bikinis. You know, just how they jiggle. I get that special tingling feeling in my tail. Enough! We will stop the cleansing of the world with your demise. Behold, I now command the very power of the Ancient One! This time, the Precursors will not have mercy on you. 
What I found pretty crazy about this fight is that this precursor robot, from what I can tell, is the same type of robot that we faced in the first game, which goes to show how much stronger Jack is now compared to before. To defeat this precursor robot, you need to dodge its laser, shoot these shadow enemies off the ledge, and then climb up this platform that, for some reason, the robot makes, making us able to shoot the cart on top, taking one health bar off the robot. Repeat this two more times, and the robot fell to its doom, allowing us to pass through towards Haven City. The sewers were filled to the brim with metalheads, so it seemed pretty clear that Haven City was no longer the same place it used to be. While making my way through these metalheads, another trophy popped for collecting 125 metalhead gems. And then, we can exit the sewers into the port, in order to return back to the naughty Otzel. Ashlyn! Ashlyn, this is Dorn! Jack's back in the city! Jack? I knew I could count on you. That new KG leader's probably pissing in his... Wait! Someone's jamming the signal. I think... Errol. I live! <laughs> Still fighting for the weak link, eh, Jack? Well, I've had a few enhancements since we last met. Even the metalheads have their biological weakness. But me? I'm pure metal. I'd love to meet you again. We must unite our forces or we're through. You've got to reach us, Jack. Fish in a barrel, baby. Fish in a barrel. So it turned out that Errol had somehow survived the crash from Jack 2 and was now one of the main people pushing this war against the city. With the KG robots now building defenses all around Haven City, it was now or never to fight back. And to do so, Daxter decides to ride a massive rocket around the city before hitting them right where it hurts. <laughs> Now that the defenses were down, we could take out all the KG snipers. Before meeting up with another familiar face. How's biz? I'm designing new guns to help out the war effort. You make guns now? Yeah, I just finished this new gun. It sports a multi-port, large-bore, gyro-burst launcher with blowback breach assist, using full jacket, eco-depleted armor-piercing slugs, and a continuous kill zone scanner for tight groupings at a high cycle rate of fire. <laughs> it's a hobby. Not so fast. First, you have to prove you can protect my little schnookums in the new gun course. The gun Tess gave us was probably one of the most useful weapons in the entire game, as the bullet would continuously bounce around, taking out most things it came in contact with. A bit later on, there was a mission that really reminded me of Jack 1. You have to eliminate all these dark eco plants with green eco, and this had to have been a throwback to the first game due to how similar it was. The reason for clearing all the dark eco plants was to clear the forest and activate this podium, for something a bit later on in the story. That if destroyed could drop some of their shield. After this, we can deliver a shipment of dark eco. finally collect all the remaining metalhead gems, <laughs> defend the naughty art soul from an attack, and get a new weapon upgrade from Tess. My hero! This city is too dangerous. We need our own little place in the country. A little pink house with a white picket fence, and a fireplace, and a big four-poster bed for me, and, and a little ossel run on the side of the house for you. Aww. Are you worried about me, my little Tessie Poo? Of course, my itty-bitty whisker puss. Oh, please. Will you two take it outside? Here's a nice boomstick for your sidekick, baby. Go give him hell, boys. Then come back, and I'll scratch you behind your ears. Believe it or not, this weapon upgrade was pretty handy, as the next task at hand was to defend the HQ from invasion. This HQ was the main building on the other side of the map, basically the naughty Otso, but for Kira, Samus and Ashlyn, instead of Torn. I really cannot stress how hard this mission was, and if anything, it may have been one of the hardest missions out of the three games. It starts out with a single ship, spawning in enemies as you try to destroy each one of its thrusters. After wasting pretty much all your ammo on this ship to take it down, the game just spawns in two more ships, which of course have double the enemies and equally double the amount of rockets coming down on you at all times. This made it extremely difficult to actually get any ammo or even attempt to shoot the thrusters on the ships as you always had to be moving to not get hit. But after multiple failed attempts, and I mean multiple failed attempts, this happened. Jack. 
This then prompts Count Vigo to come and reason with us, stating that he has the power to turn on the planetary defense system to defend our planet from the Daystar. At this point, everyone is fed up with this guy and Ashlyn strips him of all commands and dissolves the council he is a part of. This then starts Count Vigo's villain arc and we will see more of him a bit later on. For now though, the next task is to take down a floating factory producing an absurd amount of KG robots. If we don't take this factory down, then the war is pretty much over because they'll just keep spawning in. Before saving the world though, I decided to head back over to Sparga City to do a few missions that I've been holding off for a little while. There was another artifact race to attempt, well, I know what I want. A massive ambush at the main gate that needed to be defended. Oh, we would be most great. And finally, another trip to the nest with Sig to eliminate five metalhead worms. The reason I'm quickly going over these missions is because there really wasn't any advances in the story here. Just a few quick missions relating to a handful of trophies. What did advance the story though was returning back to Haven City in order to visit the forest again. This time, due to the dark eco plants being cleared, we could go ahead and activate all five pillars in the center by doing a few jetboard time trials at each of these robots. As you all know, I love these jetboard missions and with no enemies to eliminate, this was an extremely fun mission to attempt. Once all five pillars were up, you can finally get an explanation as to what the purple object is in the sky. Behold the seed of our destruction. What? What? Let me see, let me see! Is she hot? We precursors built many worlds across the universe, shaping them with eco into something good. But we were foolish. The dark makers were once precursors, but their exposure to dark eco changed them. Now the Dark Ones have found your world and are coming to claim it for themselves. Well, I could ruin your whole day! I think this one's bigger than both of us. There is but one hope left. You will find a planetary defense system hidden deep at the core of the planet. There is still a chance to save your world. Now that we know where the planetary defense system is and what we have to do to save the world from destruction, the first task at hand is to remove the infinitely spawning KG robots coming from the sky. So we headed to the sewers to flip a switch, turning off the electric fence at the power station. Then we headed over to the power station and found out that Vin is still alive. Well, technically. He uploaded his data onto the system, so he is still here, just not physically. He explains that the code to the KG factory is in the system, but it's well hidden and blocked by the mainframe security. Daxter doesn't let that stop him and jumps straight into the screen. And then we have to play Pac-Man in order to get the code. This was such an amazing mission to attempt. And even though it made no sense that Daxter could be sucked into the screen, this mission was definitely up there as one of my favorites. I'm sure I don't need to explain the concept of Pac-Man. So after clearing every orb on the screen, we receive the code to the KG factory. Got the cipher. Great work, Jack. She's got the info beamed here. That cipher key will unlock the war factory doors. We'll get on it right away and get back to you. To get to the Sky Factory, we have to jump into a ship and fly up to deal some damage. As you can probably guess, the controls were inverted yet again but this one really threw me off. There were 16 power cores to blow up, and as you can see, I couldn't even get to grips with the inverted controls to deal any damage. I did eventually get the hang of it, and after defeating all the power cores and the turrets, landed safely, and with the controls back to normal, got to work moving through the KG factory. Right at the end of this factory, we run into Errol. I found some new friends to help me conquer this puny little planet. You're talking to the Dark Makers. They want a home, someone to call a friend. Destruction of all my ego. They volunteered to help me put this puny planet out of its misery. <laughs> You're in for a big surprise. The Dark Makers don't play nicely with others. Don't fret. You won't live to see what I turn this little world into. Maybe a rock, or a floating puddle of slag, or nothing at all. Complete oblivion. So hard to choose. I won't let you do this. It turns out he's half human and half machine, which I guess supports the story on how he survived the crash. Allegedly, he's the one that called the Dark Masters. You know, the massive purple object in the sky. Jack, of course, thought this was a pretty stupid idea. And after blowing him up three times, he runs away, leaving us to escape the factory while it's falling apart. Yeah! Got away! See you later, Mechanator! Jack! The sky is falling! We took it to 
that robot goon and kicked his nuts and bolts. Errol got away, but we shut down his robot factory. That's good, but it is troubling to see what Errol is doing. We can visit the temple again in a wasteland and receive probably the best and only ability I used throughout this remaining section of the game. With the ability to fly, we can go ahead and save Seam at the temple, receiving the time map and also another trophy. As rubber wearing, completely freaky, beyond bizarre, paint faced, super weird monks go, you're all right. I have now seen the truth and I am at peace. At least I was granted the gift of seeing the face of my creators. Thank you, little one. Uh, okay. Now at this point in the game, the Daystar, purple object in the sky, or the Dark Masters, whatever you wish to call them, have now started taking over the world, and it is our job to defend Sparga's city from these enemies before they destroy the city. Again, inverted controls were the bane of my existence, but eventually I got used to it and saved Sparga's city from danger. No, even if we According to PSM profiles, this mission also gives you the third amulet and some new armor, but I skipped the cutscene by pressing triangle by accident. It was cool to know that it took defending the entire city from destruction to make us worthy of Sparga's citizenship. Moving on, we could return back to the forest again, this time with the time map from Seam, and activate another feature of the Astro Viewer. Jack, I knew that machine was special! Ah, get out of my head! Jack! Jack! I'm losing you, buddy! It's linking me into the Dark Maker ship systems. They're taking me to them. Jack! Jack! Now that we were on the ship, we had to make it through a few enemies before destroying the Dark Ship's shield. Our hero! What the? Daxter? What? 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 What'd you see? Let me look, let me look, let me look! Hello, elevator! Bottom floor! Coming up! Come on! Ah, I hate being short! It just seemed for a moment, it, it looked like... No, it couldn't have been. And after returning back to the HQ, Ashton sends us on an escort mission. And, you know, everyone loves escort missions. The whole reason for this escort mission was to blow a gap in the Metalhead Tower, allowing us to slowly battle through hundreds of Metalheads to reach the top and bump into Errol once again. I'd love to stay in chat, but I have an appointment with the most powerful beings in the universe. You're through, Metal Monkey! Don't make me come over there and sick Jack on you! You're too late. I've already awakened the Dark Mega Ship. When I come back, I will be wielding the very power of the Precursors. I'll see you boys soon. Look at that, it's cool. It's amazing. It's reacting to the dark stuff. Ah, it's gonna blow! The Metalhead Tower then blows up, giving us another trophy. Onin then briefs us on the fact that something powerful is awaking down in the catacombs, and of course, it is our job to head down there and see what is happening. Let me guess, you blowhards want us to go down there, correct? On the way there, we get swarmed by a bunch of dark machines before, out of nowhere, Damus comes in and saves the day. We can then use his vehicle to charge through generators, opening otherwise impossible areas to get to. We make it to the final generator and get absolutely destroyed, resulting in Damus being crushed and basically confusing the whole storyline. Not bad driving, kid. It was a good fight <coughs> and a good day to die. I'm very proud to have been by your side in the end. <coughs> this world is not yet out of heroes. We did well together. Don't move out. Please, promise me one thing. Promise me you'll find my son, Mar. You'll know him when you see this. He's wearing an amulet just like it. A symbol of our lineage with a great House of Mar. <coughs> Save the people, Jack. They need you. Father. I personally can't understand how Jack is Mar, as Mar built Haven City before we even arrived. I could maybe see Jack being called Mar on a respectful level, since Damus was a part of the House of Mar, but if that's the case, it was a pretty poor choice to go that route, as it left me, and probably others, confused as to who Jack actually was. Anyways, after that whole situation, Vega comes in to make his snarky comments about Jack not knowing his dad before he died, and that he apparently stole Jack as a child to experiment with Dark Eco. This causes Jack to go sicko mode, and follow him down to the catacombs. 
Once reaching the catacombs, we find the planetary defense system, which is just another precursor robot. And after activating it, a precursor comes down and actually offers us a chance to become one of them. Vega gets in the way and steals us from us. But as it turns out, the precursors are not at all what we expected. <laughs> If you had been a true hero, you would have stopped Errol by now. Oh my god. Yes, well, uh, now we are even more angry, and uh, we order you to avert your eyes, or we will learn. Oh, Bala. They look like me? Why does Daxter look like? Ah, yes. All ego contains the source of our essence. Our code, so to speak. When Daxter touched the dark ego, he was actually blessed when he thought he was cursed. Woohoo! I'm a precursor! I'm a precursor! I'm a precursor! Hey! Wait a minute! They have pants! These creatures are the great precursors? And I wanted to evolve into the... No! <laughs> A little drafty, isn't it? The only way to ensure that Errol will not awaken the ship's cargo is to go there yourself and stop him. We will send you there from here. But the weapon... Chill out, buddy. You should have Mondale minutes to go there and get back here pronto. I mean, way before the... Hopefully before. Ba-boom! Oh, yeah! Let's move. A lot of people seem to hate this outcome since the whole story so far has set the precursors up to be the most powerful entities on the planet. But I thought it fit right into how Jack and Daxter is as a game. It's funny and stupid and it's exactly the type of game to do something like this. And as a last ditch hope to save the world, we were sent to the dark ship to finish this war once and for all. We are given 5 minutes to reach the main area and after battling my way through all the dark eco enemies, we reach Errol once again. These nasty things ever wake up, the planet's finished! All of these dark makers at my command. Just think what I could do. You're through, Arrow. Even if we both die. Ah! Oh. Jack! Due to the 5 minutes being up, the planetary defense system shoots up into the ship, pretty much destroying everything in the area, before Errol reappears, escaping in a dark eco machine. Jack also reappears too, using the only ability the game cares about, and then we escape through the portal at the end of the ship. For the city. We gotta defend it. For Demos. The last charge of the Dark and Light Brigade. Let's do it, partner. This whole fight with Errol starts off pretty tedious as you have to shoot a few eco spots on the machine's leg. It's actually really hard to get the positioning right as you can't aim the gun on the car, so it was more down to luck than anything else. Eventually, I managed to blow up all the eco spots and even though Errol detaches himself from the lower half, he ends up crashing the ship anyways. After speeding over to him, we can eliminate a bunch of dark eco enemies before getting to the main part of this fight and what a fight it was. I didn't expect this fight to be so hard, but it makes sense given all we've been through to get here. The first wave of the fight basically acted as a tutorial. You have to eliminate a few dark eco enemies, dodge a laser beam, and then shoot the machine in the back of the head to knock off a bar of health. The second wave was pretty similar to the first, but they just upped the damage. Enemies spawn in pretty much constantly at this point. There's a spinning disc that flies at you that is basically unavoidable, and on top of that, the boss will constantly spam those laser beams, which made it really hard to focus on the smaller enemies. I did figure out that you can shoot the boss's head before it does the last laser move, which saved a bit of time and a bit of health. The last wave, however, changed everything up. The laser beam was present pretty much 90% of the time, which meant dodging it at all times. The boss also constantly slammed the ground. It did this a few times in the previous waves, but this one was 3 or 4 slams per move, which was kind of scary since I had minimal health remaining. And of course, more flying discs, which actually managed to end my run as I was just about to end the boss's life. 
However, on my fifth or sixth attempt, I beat both the first and second wave with minimal health loss and dodged every head slam perfectly before shooting the back of his head one final time to end this fight once and for all. more challenges in the future. More adventures? Where have I heard that before? We need heroes like you to help us protect the universe, Jack. Then you can call me by my first name, by what my father called me, Mar. Wait, Jack is Mar? The Mar? Come then, Ma. No time like the present. You coming, Dax? Eh, I got all I need right here, baby. We owe you much, Daxter, for all you've done. For your bravery in the face of incredible danger, we shall grant you your deepest desire. You know, I could really use a snazzy pair of pants, like yours. Wow, those are sharp. I wish I had a pair just like that. Be careful what you wish for. Don't worry, honey. You get used to it. Oh, and you may want to shave some parts. Trust me on that. Hey! Thanks for everything, partner. I couldn't leave you, Dax. With all our adventures ahead, you wouldn't last a second without me. Ah, what a team we are! Yeah, well, the next adventure, I call the shots. Put it in, partner. Ha! Say! Oh, yeah. Life is good. After beating the final game in the trilogy, I can actually say I was pretty pleased with how the story concluded all things considered. I'm pretty sure they were going to continue with Jack 4, and that's why there isn't necessarily a proper conclusion to the Jack and Dexter storyline. But I mean, at this point, we aren't getting a fourth game, so this was the best ending we were going to get. To achieve the final platinum of the video, all that was left to do was a cleanup run of the remaining orbs. This time, the game wants you to collect 600 of them, and this was a much lengthier process than the 286 from Jack 2. Many of the required side missions make their return, like reaching gold on the gun course, reaching gold in a jetboard mission, and hunting for an extremely large amount of hidden precursor orbs. But there were actually a few new side missions that really made this final step to the Platinum a bit more enjoyable than it should have been. For example, the Pac-Man game from earlier now requires you to reach a thousand points to earn a few hidden precursor orbs. There were also a few wasteland missions that require you to do different things with your vehicle, like reaching a total distance of 800 meters or having a total hang time of 15 seconds. While doing these missions, I was making sure to also pick up all precursor orbs lying around the map and quickly collected 50 orbs for a trophy. And then a bit later on, we reached 300 orbs for another trophy. And then finally, after clearing up the remaining side missions, collected the final set of orbs in the ruined stadium for the last trophy, and more importantly, that third and final platinum of the video. The Jack and Daxter trilogy may go down as one of the best trilogies I've played in a while, and even though I dislike the direction they took from Jack 1 to 2, 
I do think the jump from two to three was much more enjoyable and made much more sense. I can safely say that without a doubt, Jack 3 is my favorite in the trilogy, with the original game ranking very close behind, as they were both equally as enjoyable. Jack 2, on the other hand, while still a great game, which is not at all what I was expecting coming off the first title. Either way, I really enjoyed this trilogy, and it was definitely a breath of fresh air to head back a few generations and experience one of the PS2 greats. I know this video was on the longer side, but I really do appreciate you all for watching, and I'll see you all very soon in the next one. Bye-bye!